Good morning. Oh, you're oh so nice, aren't you? Uh, uh, this is going to be a little different than the other talks, and I'll show you why in a second. I'll ask you why. Uh, I'd like to see a show of hands of people who are direct service providers or supervisors or directors or students training to be something like that. Can I? Okay. So I will assume the rest of you are either academics or unemployed. Is that, <laughs> is that the basis of? Uh, for those unemployed, um, the good news this morning is that the jobless rate dropped. Um, not in our field. Um, so uh, the reason I asked that question was not just to determine uh, who's out there, for, but to change the focus of what we've been discussing. And one of the things I'm going to do is I, I noticed that the number of slides I have is about half of what most people have been providing. So I want to spend some time after discussing this with you. We can do that in a big group, I think. But only if you uh, take it seriously. And so you have an assignment. That sounds terrible. Uh, because this is being recorded, hi, uh, we, uh, we can't interrupt while I'm talking about questions. So I'd like you to write down your questions as you think of them, something that provokes you, something you want to ask me. And either you can uh, pass them in to someone who'll pick them up or get up and very loudly ask the question. And, I will tr and remind me to repeat it because if I, but, but if I can hear it, probably everybody else can hear it. So we'll, we'll try that. Uh, the reason I asked how many of you were, to use uh, an Australian phrase, are on the coal face dealing with it, is we're shifting attention in this talk from who? Everything we've discussed up till now has been uh, focused on the client or the client's family. Now we're going to focus on you because you are the critical element in providing care. And we're now going to talk more about changing your behavior, changing the organization in which you operate as in contrast to just changing the client. So you are the victim now, okay? You're the subject in the experiment, and so we're reversing roles on that a little bit. Uh, I do want to thank Bill for inviting me. Uh, this, this is the second time I've come to the Niagara Conference. I'm only afraid he's going to invite me back until I get it right. Um, so I don't know if that's the case. The other confusing thing here is uh, I keep asking people where the falls are, and people in Miami doesn't seem to know. So. Uh, if there are falls in, Miami, in Florida, please let me know. Uh, since Niagara and Miami, I thought at least would have something. Okay. Uh, I'll be talking about one of the things that, that we've developed called a contextualized feedback systems, or CFS. This is this disclaimer that uh, I'm, uh, to show that I have a potential conflict of interest when I talk about it. I'm not trying to sell you a, a product. I'll be talking about other products as well, of things that you can use to meet the needs that I think you need to meet. OK. Uh, how many people think that mental health is in a crisis? Yeah, OK. What is the crisis? Well, we've heard uh, poor access. We've seen people report at this conference that there is um, Less data, less services available, fewer services available than there are people of needs. We don't have the human resources that we need, uh, trained, qualified um, clinicians. That money is short, and as we talk, getting shorter. And in, especially in residential facilities, there seems to be some st substandard conditions. And this, I think, uh, the rest of you didn't raise your hand about crisis. You should be aware of that. And that does constitute a crisis. And I call it the conspicuous crisis, the crisis that we're aware of, or most of us at least, and that means we need some action. Uh, but there's a quiet crisis, and this is the uncomfortable one we prefer not to talk about. And this is the question about whether usual care, the care uh, uh, that you see in the community that you provide, is in fact effective. Now one of the things that you might have found a little bit confusing during the past two days 
is people getting up and talking about effect sizes. Uh, like, you know, everybody should know what they are. Uh, and you heard two different things. You heard people talking about very small effect sizes, 0 0.16, 0 0.20, and then very large ones, 1 1.8 and 2.0. And so some studies are finding very strong effects. Others are finding very weak effects. And there's a whole series of studies no one talked about. Which are those? Come on, guys, a little thinking. The ones that are finding no effects, people don't talk about those. You didn't hear all of the studies that, because typically they don't get published, or if they do, people don't want to talk about them. Or they often are the studies that I did. Um, I'll talk about them. Um, why the disparity? Is it some have effective treatment and some not? Well, the main disparity, is, and I want to draw that distinction for you so you sort of remember when you hear these things, is between studies called effectiveness studies and studies called efficacy studies. You're shaking your head, you heard that. So efficacy studies are ones done under ideal conditions, laboratory-like studies, typically Selected population, um, typically very diagnostically pure if they could find it, typically done in a university set clinic, uh, and typically implemented by graduate students of the professor. Effectiveness studies are one done in your settings. Is anybody participating in a study with a university in their own settings now? One person. You're not from here, are you? Huh? No. OK. Amazing. All right? Nobody's doing any research in the real world. So when you hear this stuff and you hear about the effectiveness or the impact of the studies, the natural questions that will come to the mind, will it apply in my setting? Because we know context is an important factor in determining the effectiveness of whatever treatment or program. And you've got to ask that. Are these kids like my kids? Are the clinicians like my, the clinicians tested? Is it a feasible intervention to do? Will clinicians do it? Will the organization do it? Does anybody care? Now, the absence of studies is, to me, is disturbing because it means we're not learning anything from your work. Zero. There's no accumulation of knowledge. And that's, that's a shame. So we're learning from these very special studies that find a big effects. And we go into the real world, we find effects. Let me use a, a, a gentle word, get attenuated. They tend to disappear also. And it's still a puzzle exactly why. Um, this is a, uh, my feeble attempt to communicate this in, to the real world. Mainly academics speak to other academics and publish. But this is an article that just came out a few weeks ago in um, our local newspaper, the Tennessean, which is, I found out, the 51st largest newspaper in the country, so it's not that, that bad. Um, and it's part of a chain, so it get, gets picked up. How many have seen this? Yeah, that's about the impact, I expect. <laughs> uh, I, I did find out from some people, I was, at, I was in Tampa on Sunday and Monday, and said, oh, but this has been on, the, on listservs among psychologists all over the place talking about it. I said, no, gee, no one's written me about it. There, w there was one comment published in the newspaper. The guy said, oh, great news. Where you, what have you been doing for the last 100 years? Um, now, the other thing you learn about newspapers is you don't make the headlines. They do. OK, so that's not mine. But the point I wanted to make here, and you can't read it, and I can, uh, was after Newtown, uh, President Obama said, quote, we need to make access to mental health care at least as easy as access to guns. A real neat idea, I thought. And then I said, that's not the problem. That's a problem. And what I go on in the article, I'll be happy to send it to anybody who, who writes to me, was it's not the access issue that's the only problem. It's the one we focus on. But why do you want to increase access to services that may not be effective? It seems a rather pointless exercise. The real problem is how do we make our services more effective than they are now? And I provide some suggestions in there. Uh, so how do I know that services 
And remember, this is, th these are very few studies, okay? All right, so the latest data goes back several years. 4.6 million children costing $8.9 billion in cost. Looking at UC or usual care or t tau sometimes, treatment as usual. Uh, those with control groups, and there's not many studies because people don't, as evidenced by this audience, you're not doing it and no one's doing it with you. Uh, they show little or no effective treatment. In uncontrolled studies, that is where there's no comparison group, um, about 50% of the kids improve, the rest show no improvement, which is the, is the bigger majority, and some, some about 10 or 15% show deterioration over time. Uh, this is best summarized uh, by an article by Ann Gall and, and her colleagues in the journal that I edit, that was the start of this editorial, this opinion piece, in which I asked her to review the literature on usual care, which is one of her uh, areas of strengths, and come up with a conclusion about it. And then I asked eight people who I respected, from policy level people to commissioners to other researchers, to comment on this. And I was surprised that no one disagreed with this. Now maybe it had something to do with me picking them, but I, don't, I was purely objective in that. So the, among researchers at least, and some were, were very strong in that comment saying, policymakers and everybody else knows the, the, for years and they haven't done anything about it. Why? Part of it is, and this is my reasoning, is that the crisis developed because we believe in certain myths. And I defined a myth out of the um, dictionary.com as an unproved or false collective belief that is used to justify a social institution. So a myth is not necessarily wrong, okay, but it's unproven at least. So what am I saying is unproven? What's unproven is that services are effective. And they were based on a lot of assumptions that we th think make us comfortable and make us feel that they are effective. And what are some of these things? Um, some of you m may, anybody know the Fort Bragg study? Ah, yeah, the students and professors, okay. <laughs> well, at least that, I mean, that's, that could be, this goes back to 1994. I was a mere child back then, and uh, this was actually the first study of a system of care and lost in the history of, of system care, we're still, and we had the um, creativity involved in naming projects by where they occur. So this occurred actually at Fort Bragg, not, not the Army Post in, um, where this was the first time uh, a full system of care was introduced into a, a complete system and it was had comparisons with two other army posts, uh, one in Georgia and one in Kentucky, and we compared the full system of care to regular services. Now, in, back in those days, to, we have progressed. The only service you can get that was insured was either outpatient or inpatient, literally. And you didn't have group homes, you didn't have um, intensive outpatient, you didn't have in-home services. Those were all innovations back in 1994. And so this was not an inexpensive study. It cost $94 million to do. Um, of course, it didn't start that way. It's a typical defense project. Uh, uh, ran over budget and time. But the bottom line here was that this is the first study to actually measure clinical outcomes and cost in the same study. And what did we find? that the clinical outcomes for the kids treated in the system of care were no better than those received who just got outpatient or inpatient services. Um, but it was more expensive. Uh, this did not sit well with the system of care advocates because this was, at this point, and it's dying off a little bit, 17 years later in some ways, 20 years later, um, it was an ideology, it was a belief system, it's still believed by many people in the, in the foremost thing. But basically, uh, we couldn't support the basic concepts behind what seemed to be a very reasonable thing. Provide services adapted to the level of care that children needed. 
Those who need more severe, we get more intensive services. But it didn't occur at the treatment level, nothing, okay? It was basically boxes. Where do you put, which kid do you put in what box? And I've, we did some studies to indicate that clinicians actually couldn't assign reliably kids to different levels of care, which was a problem. We replicated the findings in a civilian population in Ohio in a randomized study. And, I'm, and basically, that ended a research on systems of care for the next 20 years. Uh, no one's gotten funded to, and it, there's some, been some transformation. It's now some of the same principles are called wraparound. We've done, so it, it's under a different title. Uh, the basic principle here was system level reform affects variables at the system level. Cost, access. In fact, the access issue was so nicely done here that the Army was worried that by uh, within 10 years, every child in that catchment area would be receiving mental health services, which was going up like this. And that was not something uh, Army people relished, one, because of cost, and second, because of fears of dependency. And they didn't see this as a positive thing that way. Um, so this was sort of the first myth I dealt with, is that systems of care are better for kids than non-systems of care in terms of their clinical outcomes. Yes, it has positive effects on access, so a system, and a negative effects on cost, primarily because kids were kept in treatment forever. And even though every time they looked at it and said, we avoided a hospitalization, okay, um, they didn't realize that they had put kids into um, a residential treatment group home at half the price but four times the length of time. And if you all, you, it's arithmetic. It doesn't take long to figure out. But it's not something you can see as you're managing a system like that unless you're looking at the cost data, which they weren't. Um, in 1999, I, I had an article published called Practice Makes Perfect and Other B Myths About Mental Health Services. And this is the list that I included, and you can agree or disagree with that, but let you think about it. Um, experienced clinicians deliver more effective services. That's why we pay you more if you have more years of service. Or do we pay you because you have more years of service, but that's easy to count and subjective. Advanced degree programs produce more effective clinicians. No evidence of that. Continuing education, I hate, always hate to say this one, like this one. Um, improves effectiveness of clinicians? No. Nope. That one is dead as a doornail, okay? Uh, healthcare, medical, you know, they have no CEU credits, just, you know, if you wanna to go to a nice place like Florida or Hawaii, it's really a good idea. Get you out of work for a day or two, go to a nice place. But in terms of affecting your practice, no evidence. This is not the way to, to change anything. Licensing, no. Now, there, there's no research on licensing, basically. So whether you're licensed or unlicensed, we don't know whether that makes you a better clinician. Uh, accreditation of institutions um, probably helps in terms of preventing deaths, but I'm not sure it does anything else. And clinical supervision. How many of you get clinical supervision? Can I show a CC hands? So um, is it good? How do you know? Uh, let me ask you another question. And I'm, I'm, under duress, is that the supervisor speaking or the? Uh... <laughs> so name another profession in which the supervisor only knows what the supervisee tells him. Anybody? No, not interesting. So who would invent something like this and call it supervision? Obviously, the supervisees, it's a great deal. Uh, we sort of know, uh, after interviewing clinicians, uh, we had a case where we saw one group had this diagnosis for kids almost all 80% of the time, and the other diagnosis, the group had a different diagnosis. So I said, are kids assigned by diagnosis to different teams? No, no. If a clinician said to me, if I come in with any diagnosis that, other than that one, I get questioned by my supervisor. 
But I'll come up with that one, no questions. So, so much for validity of diagnosis. We haven't, I haven't found any research that has changed this over the last 13 years about supporting that. Um, three more that I've recently added. Uh, one that goes to the heart of this conference. Evidence-based treatments are just as effective in the real world. I think you've heard that they're not. At least the studies that compare them show at least a 50% drop. Why? I'll tell you. Um, how many here take progress notes? Everybody takes progress Why? Why? I can't hear you. Just, huh? It's required, aren't you? Good. You're so, so wonderful. It's required. Simple answer. Why is it required? Billing. Why do you think billing requires it? Hmm? Validate the services. So does anybody ever read the progress notes, you think? Your supervisor does? Uh, I, I have friends who are physicians. They said, it's very interesting. Now in, in, in medicine where they're a lot more advanced electronically than we are, they, they, he says, I don't understand what the insurance companies are complaining about. They gave us the ability to cut and paste notes, and now they're complaining that we cut and paste notes. <laughs> So, um, and I've seen computer programs where you could sit all day and literally it takes, if you have 30 clients, it can take a full day, even with a computer assisted, click and point to different things in your progress. And it takes a day to do it. Why? I think it's because nobody trusts us. Okay? They don't trust that we do anything. Because we're a healthcare provider that doesn't have any procedures. And so nobody, know, nobody knows what we do, so they come up with all these proxies for thinking that they now know what you're doing. And if it's there, it's there. And, it's, and so my question about progress notes and other paperwork, which is humongous, it's our biggest barrier to really providing effective services. Um, and I don't know why, and I've been in states where we've reformed our paperwork, we've increased it. Oh, why? Uh, and I've also gone into, I would advise you all to go back and, if you have the courage, to, to ask about your paperwork and find out what really is required. Because every time I've gone into a setting, I always found out that there's at least a bunch of things that are being filled out that were required 10 years ago, but not any longer, and it just continues on its own merits, which is none. Uh, so be careful about that. Bottom line, though, getting to a point here, is that our society doesn't support effective services. So there's nothing in the funding or the way we provide services that reinforces or provides the reason to provide effective services. Your billing is by time. Uh, you don't monitor what you do. You don't have outcomes. Uh, it's easy to count. It's easy to control. I mean, you don't have in other health care Oh, I see you had a cancer treatment. It didn't work. Well, that's it. You're done. <laughs> oh, you had your eight sessions. Oh, let me go argue on the, uh, with your case manager for the insurance company about why you should have another two sessions. And neither one of us has any data, so we'll see who's smarter and willing to figure out what sort of words you like to hear that will give me the other few sessions or few days. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a solution, a partial solution, not the full solution, but it comes in the generic name of a measurement feedback system. And one that I think will help get rid of some of these myths. So what is this? It's simple in concept and difficult in application. It's a ministering, at this point in this century so far, it's questionnaires concurrent with treatment, and providing rapid, useful, objective feedback to the clinician, the case manager, the supervisor, whoever you want, the client, includes clinical processes, what we think are important clinical processes, but no one's ever approved yet, like Therapeutic Alliance, 
uh, and can include the context and outcomes. And fortunately or unfortunately, we're now at the age where the only way to do this is through using digital technology, computers, web-based types of applications, which I will talk about. Two questions, how do you use, what, what type of feedback do you get in your everyday life? I'm not gonna ask for responses because of time. And what about professional life? I used to say clinicians don't get feedback. No, you get lots of feedback. I corrected myself and I said, oh, you don't get accurate feedback. And that's a problem. Because without accurate feedback, you can't learn and do a better job. We know that. That's not unique to clinical care. It's part of learning. It requires accurate feedback. How do you learn on the job? You learn from your successes and failures. Do you have any idea about your successes and failures? I would challenge you that you don't, and if you think you do, you're probably wrong. How's that? Uh, because no one does any, any um, for a couple of reasons. One, we highly, as human beings, distort our feedback so that we can live with ourselves. And we tend to do that a great deal. I don't believe you can be an effective clinician if you don't believe in the effectiveness of your own services. Uh, it's a hard enough job as it is, so you have to maintain that belief. I don't want you to walk away from here saying, I'm a terrible clinician, I have the faintest idea, you may be great, okay? And your defense mechanisms may be very strong and you're not even listening to me anymore. <laughs> so that's all very possible. Um, I call it a revolutionary or evolutionary revolutionary solution to the part of the problem, and let me tell you why, okay? It's revolutionary in that it uses data, and mental health people are the last people to use data, apparently in healthcare. Uh, and everybody uses data now, I'll point it out. It makes treatment transparent or more transparent. Uh, we call treatment as usual a black box, right? Because we don't know what the hell it is. It's private. Now the term black box comes one derivation of that. Does anybody know where it comes from? Huh? Airplanes. No. And it's not, that box is orange. So, so it's a misnomer even there. Um, actually comes from uh, development of transistors where um, the developers would want to keep their, their circuit um, secret so they cover it with black epoxy so you couldn't see what's inside the black box. We do that by calling it privacy. That's our black box. So we don't know what treatment is unless you're doing an evidence-based treatment with monitoring, okay? Multiple perspectives. Everybody talks about that, but no one really pays attention to it. One of the conundrums that we don't know how to deal with as researchers, and I'd be interested in how clinicians deal with it, is that nobody agrees with anybody else if you look at the data. You heard someone talk about that earlier. If you look at the correlations on just severity of illness, it's low between the clinician, the parent, and the youth. Can't agree on severity. Yet, the clinician thinks that he or she is right because they're the clinician. But there's disagreement on that. I'll point out some other ones. Now, what makes it evolutionary is we don't tell the clinician what to do. It's not, it doesn't provide the solutions. It lets you use whatever clinical skill you have or don't have to make decisions. But it gives you the data to make decisions and it gives you the information back on whether you're apparently making the right ones. Uh, it doesn't replace other evidence-based treatments. We're doing a study now that combines CFS with uh, Tom Sexton's family, uh, FFT family functioning treatment, uh, because we, we, we think the, and the NIMH agreed with us at that point, that the best combination is where you're using evidence-based treatment and giving the clinician individualized feedback because most evidence-based treatments don't have the ability to provide that t level of fine-grained feedback. And it's, it's a pan-theoretical approach. It doesn't matter whether you're doing um, 
CBT or IRT or whatever T you want to use, um, you can just change your measures. It doesn't depend on diagnosis, theory, or type of treatment. Feedback is important regardless of what you're doing. Uh, I was dinner last night. The applied behavioral analysis people know this for years, but the rest of us refuse to recognize it. So they know where their treatment's working because they see it. It's part of their regimen. It's part of their process to collect data as they're doing their treatment. All right. What are our current problems? Um, there is no quality improvement process in place in most service settings. You can't do any better. And in addition, you guys have really worked out the best shell game in the world. There's no accountability. Uh, we can't observe what you do. Now, I'll be very crude. Just don't kill anybody. All right? If you don't kill anybody and hand your paperwork in on time, you have a job. Um, so there's no accountability. There's no measures of quality. If you do, now here's where it gets a little controversial, assuming what I said hasn't been controversial at all, um, evidence-based treatments. Uh, I know from my experience with them that a lot of places can go in and, and they have uh, the claim, we're using evidence-based treatment because our clinicians attended a workshop one afternoon. <laughs> You're laughing, huh? That's what they say, and I, I have to believe them. They must be doing it. Uh, because they said they are, and that must have been a great workshop because, you know, workshops don't work. Um, so it must have been a real good one. So unless you monitor the implementation of evidence-based treatment, you have little assurance that you're actually delivering something different than you've delivered before. And if there's no accountability, no monitoring. The third thing, service as a commodity, and this goes back to our funding issues. How do we fund services? You know what a commodity is? Those of you who invested in gold or pig bellies or those are commodities, wheat. A commodity, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. They don't differentiate. There's no quality there. It's set as a standard. An hour of service is an hour of service is an hour of service. It doesn't matter who provides it. It doesn't matter whether it's effective. It doesn't matter what the quality is. And that's killing us, and people don't understand it. So how do you price commodities? You price them essentially in their rareness or their competition. So if you are directing an agency and a state says, we're going to issue an RFP for a contract to provide 1,000 hours of counseling for this population, who wins the contract? The lowest bidder. It's a commodity. They don't ask you, oh, we'll pay more if you deliver better services, if you've shown it's effective, if you have a history of effective service, if you show that you can even measure the quality of your service. And what has happened over the past 15 years, and this is at a macro level, is that there's been a disinvestment in mental health. Why? Because people underbid each other. It's a natural economic downward spiral. And as long as we're only competing with each other on the basis of price, you lose one year, next year you're going to bid a lower price. And there's be less money. And then we complain there's less money. But we're part of the process. We participate in that. We don't say, no, we, we want you to include quality standards. No, because we think we're going to get hurt by that. And we're getting killed by the commodity orientation. And we're losing money that way. But it's subtle. It's, again, part of that quiet, hidden crisis that's going on in the funding thing. Because we're afraid of quality, we're afraid to admit that we may not be effective, and we don't want to be compared to other people based on that. Quality improvement and MFS provides feedback, which is core of our learning. It empowers consumers. Everybody's interested about consumers, but they're not doing very much about it because they don't know anything. So if you're a consumer and I want to know, I want a better service, I want a better clinician, or my kid's not getting any better, you know, it's my word against your word. And the, the parent's word doesn't count for very much. You have some data. You can look. Is your, is your kid getting better? Why not? If not, what are you going to do about it? What's going to change? Uh, finally, one big point is data infrastructure. And I, I just want to, if you're a researcher, this is very important. But if you're a service provider, this is of crucial importance. 
and people don't understand that point either. This is the era, and I'll point to another slide, of big data. Health is progressing not because of a series of randomized clinical trials done by researchers, but by accumulating data about cases, and I'll point out lots of success stories that. We don't have a data infrastructure in this country. We don't have it even locally. I was speaking to someone before to talk about who works in a school district. Contract out for services. Are they any good? I don't know. You don't know. You, know, I know. you may not be paying for it, but someone's paying for it. Are you getting your money's worth? Are you learning anything from these things? Nope. Bad position to be in. Efficiency. This actually is controversial because we may not need any more money in mental health. We may just need to operate like we're in the 21st century. And we don't. Our management is very paperwork oriented, takes up loads of time. Uh, it's really sort of mom and pop operations. There are advances out there. Now, I deal with programming and computer stuff all the time, and it is the biggest pain in the ass I've ever had in my life. So I'm not going in saying, oh, there's wonderful nirvana out there. No, 80% of the projects that involve computer programming do not come in on budget or on time, and maybe 20 to 30% never come in at all. So this is not an easy field. So it's not, oh, we got the solution already. This is cutting edge stuff, or what I prefer to call bleeding edge stuff. Uh, paperwork is time consuming, everybody complains about it. I don't know why, but people are not doing very much about it. Uh, show me, why is it there? It's there, again, I think because of basic questions of trust. Um, they want to pass on something objective, so there's lots of paperwork to fill in. Yes, there are medical legal reasons why you want to have progress notes in case you get sued, but that's relatively rare. Um, management feedback system generates information, analysis, using modern technology. That data is power. I, I looked it up. I said, can you now use the singular for data? And the answer is yes. And that's off the popular science. And what, how information is driving the future? Oh, they don't give any examples in mental health. They use uh, police departments, for example, using data for directed patrol. Uh, the classic example now is Moneyball. People know that movie? Yeah. Um, great success story of the athletic A's using data to pick out who the best people to hire are. And they won the Pennant and World Series based on that. Now they're not doing so well, but everybody else is using the same approach. Uh, so data could be very useful to identifying effective procedures and trying to answer the age-old question, what works best for who? We don't know how to answer that now. Optimize and individualize. It always boggled my mind. Systems of care always had that as a thing. Individualized treatment. How do you do it? What do you have to know? Um, well, you need information about the individual. And most of the time, we don't have any information. Uh, people who collect baseline data and, every, and then post-test data, they don't have any information about the process. What's going on? Is the person getting better or worse? What the characteristics of the person? If you are going to individualize, you need to have concurrent information. Finding out that you were doing whatever it was that wasn't working three months ago is useless information for everybody. Now, I do a lot of work in Australia, and they have one of the most useless systems in the world because they collect, they attempt to collect data every three months. And I say attempt because they can't get the clinicians to collect the data. And they wonder why. They say it's so important. Well, it's not important for clinicians. If you want to, make, to have clinicians collect the data, you need to make it important to them. How does it, and it's our basic principle, we need to be sure we're providing new information to clinicians that help them manage their cases, not information for epidemiologists and researchers. I keep telling them, have the epidemiologists collect the data if that's what you're interested in. So we know that some things change over time, some things don't. Therapeutic alliance, difficult, difficult concept to measure. Um, we try to do that. Uh, we try to, and again, one of the things in our system, our 
we developed a whole battery of measures which are free called the Peabody Treatment Progress Battery. They're free in paper and pencil. And they're brilliant measures. Why do I say that other than ego, okay? I say it because they're short. They're not any better in terms of validity than anything else, but they're the shortest measures around because time is a critical factor. So we have these measures being completed on a certain schedule during sessions. And yes, Medicaid and a lot of states say that's part of treatment now, so you can bill for that. And they collect the data using very brief measures. Um, we don't provide clinicians with the needed tools they, that they have to have to manage their cases better. And I talked about consensus. Here's a simple one. Therapeutic alliance. We measure it every session. We ask the clinician just four questions, basically, in a session base, not global, what do you think it is? What was the therapeutic working relationship? One question between you and the caregiver, parent, and you and the youth. Just one five-point scale each. Then we have some two other questions. How do you think the youth and how do you think the caregiver will rate them? And there is remarkably a 0.8 correlation between their own ratings and their estimate of how the parent and youth will rate it. So they really agree with themselves, which is good for consistency. But lo and behold, they don't agree what the actual ratings of the parent and youth are. Their correlation is 0.2 to 0.3. So they don't know, based on this information, really what the alliance level is for them and how they're seeing the session, which I think is more clinically important than their own view, but may not be. We don't know. Um, they also think that the clinician, if you're doing well with the parent, you're doing well with the youth. That correlation the clinician said is 0.6, but actually it's 0.2. So you really can't predict very well from the client to the caregiver. So you need feedback, and the immediate feedback on problems, because problems are not always the same. Uh, you need to remind the clinician about what they need to be discussing, because they drift, and they're not always focused on the problems that are of interest, and other research has shown that. Little agreement on what problems you should deal with from among the three parties here. That makes life complicated for family. And now, the supervisor has information that they can provide feedback on about how they're doing with clients, independent of what they're being told. There's a gap, we know, between current research that research funds, well, especially now, can't fill that gap, never will. There's no inexpensive way to learn from practice how to do better. And so we can do this with a measurement feedback system, collect information, if there's a lot of data, you can use nice fancy algorithms that are being developed at a marketing area in retail, identifying sales trends and who is responsible. The, the, the procedures are out there. We just don't know about them. Uh, you can gather information from diverse units of service. You can customize it. And you can provide what I think is more important is practice-based evidence about what works and what's not. And what works here means what is practical as well as what's theoretically meaningful work. Uh, one general slide, this is a literature review done by Collier, 52 randomized clinical trials shows that feedback improves outcomes for clients. Uh, Michael Lambert has an OQ system, he's a pioneer in this area, he works primarily with adults, he's been able to show mainly in counseling centers uh, that feedback to the counselors improved outcomes. Duncan and Miller have my outcome system. And there's an English system called the core system that's been in operation for years, also has demonstrated you get better outcomes if you give clinicians feedback along the time. Um, this is a, a feeble attempt. I'm not going to go over it because it's probably very biased. It's off the websites of, of the three, I guess, what I can say, the three commercial uh, man measurement feedback systems and how they differ. You can look at that it's in the slides. Uh, but it's an interpretation of one of my staff members. I tried to make it as objective as possible, but it's one of my staff, so I don't think it is. Um, but uh, I won't go over that in any detail. Um, just a word about systems of care. I started with that. 
about 20 years later, the developers of systems care recognized the need to improve treatment. <sighs> Hooray. Okay, and it took 20 years. Okay, so they're seeing now that we got to improve treatment within a system of care. I'm not against systems care. We need to deal with access issues and cost issues. We've got to do it intelligently. All right, I'm going to show you if it works, and it should. Um, uh, the slide after this is a, a brief picture of what CFS looks like. But basically, the model, which is heavily based, I'm not presenting any of this stuff, on um, social psychological theory of change for the clinician. And one thing that people are leaving out in lots of things is organizational change. Adopting a measurement feedback system is an organizational strategy for change and improving quality. It has to involve the principles of what goes on at the organizational level as well as the individual level. And I learned that the hard way. Um, organizations differ tremendously. Some of them are ready for this. If you have a badly, I won't ask for a show of hands, if you have a badly managed organization, um, CFS or any of these things will be difficult to implement because it uncovers all sorts of things people have hidden for years. And it's hard, okay? It makes things accountable, it makes things transparent. It's, I'm not saying you hold clinicians accountable for outcomes, but you hold them accountable for implementation of the system. And I can show you that briefly. I'm logged into CFS as a clinician. I'm going to show you how to access a clinical feedback report. You scroll down to the client's table, and there's lots of information already of a feedback nature that can help you determine uh, which feedback report you might want to look at first. You can choose it, obviously, by the client's name. You can group clients by the programs. Each one of these columns is sortable. You can look at feedback reports for sessions that are coming up next. Um, or one helpful way to do it is really to group uh, the feedback reports, look at those for the clients who are doing most poorly first. Uh, this is severity rated by me from the last session. And then this is the change between the last session and the one before, the minimum detectable change that sh tells me whether or not the, th the rating is staying stable, declining, or as you can see here, improving. I'm going to um, choose this report to look at for Seth Henley. You can also see that I've actually looked at it before. It's grayed out, but for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll go ahead and click on that. What's going to come up is what we call our at-a-glance page. In CFS, we have a philosophy of trying to show the minimum amount of information at a time that's needed in order to take the next action. So for the at-a-glance page, we just show the current ratings for each questionnaire by respondent, um, and the current rating is a bullet graph that uh, shows very clearly where the black line is, whether or not that rating was in the poor, fair, or good range according to our psych uh, in comparison to our psychometric sample. You have access to a lot of other detail if you need it, including uh, more information on the minimum detectable change score, uh, trend over time, and the item history. When you have a measure filled out by more than one respondent, in addition, you also get a multiple respondent comparison. So I'm going to click on that just to show you some of the detail that you can get. Um, and clearly, you would do this for a clinical purpose. Here, what you can see is that anyone who's filling out that questionnaire, all of our responses are placed on the same graph to um, better visually present that information for comparative purposes. You get um, scores over time. And then you also get the responses from the last time that the questionnaire was completed by, by each respondent. Here you can see uh, one of these items is marked in yellow. That means there's more than a uh, one point difference between um, the ratings on that item by the different respondents. So it's highlighted so the clinician can pay additional attention to that. I'll close up that particular detail and show you a couple others. The really nice thing about the CFS uh, clinical feedback report is that you can pick any detail that you want to look at at the same time so the clinician can tailor this report to show the clinical information 
of most interest to them. So here what you can see is that I have chosen to show the detail for the caregiver's trend over time. And in addition, I am showing the uh, item history for items rated by uh, the clinician. And as you can see, the, uh, uh, there are all of the items and responses over time. There, there's also gray highlighting, and that indicates an item alert. That's an item where the response is in the top 25th percentile of the negative range. There's something going on there. This is very helpful to bring into the next session as something to address in treatment. So that is the quick view of the CFS clinical feedback report. Uh, there's lots of case studies I can give you. Let me just briefly explain one of them. This was a real case presented to us. Uh, the real name was Carlos. I gave it away. I never went. Uh, first session, mother said, kid's not doing well, but not much else. The plan was, oh, we're going to spend three or four sessions developing rapport and therapeutic alliance. And, but the first feedback report told a very different story. It showed severity rating uh, in the um, almost poor rating by the youth and got the attention of the clinician. They then looked at the items, and you can see all the items here are high internalizing items. Uh, the next session to call us, and the clinician looked at the feedback report they filled out and decided that what the kid's problem was was social anxiety and came up with a plan for dealing with this. This happens over and over again where the first few sessions, which is taken up in a lot of assessment, is often foreshortened by having immediate feedback on how the child is doing on some of the key, key measures. Uh, the biggest problem we found, though, was clinicians not even paying attention to the feedback report. So if case after the case with a, a youth could be talking about, not talking about, could be sending on that questionnaire to us and the clinician that they have an alcohol problem or a drug problem, and it's never discussed in treatment, except three months later. Um, why does this happen? It could be that the youth is reporting it on the questionnaire and not saying anything to the clinician. Or it could be the clinician is ignoring it because they don't know how to deal with it. They don't want to deal with it. There's nobody supervising that could know about it. So one of the things that we developed to make it more transparent is something called um, a session report form, which is really simple. It takes less than a minute to complete. It's tied to all our measures. We have 13 different measures. And it simply describes, the clinician says at the end of the session, here are things I talked about on a checklist, and that can vary. And the system now has a double feedback loop. So if they're not discussing something that's showing up on the questionnaires as critical, they get an alert to that fact. And so does the supervisor. So that they don't continue to miss key elements that are not in their head, but in the heads of their clients or caregivers. Uh, just an attempt to get beyond this trend. And this is, again, if it's an evidence-based treatment, we encode it in the basis of the evidence-based treatment <coughs> paradigm. Oh, you need to be doing, dealing with, uh, for example, blame. Is, uh, functional family therapy is important. That shows up as a separate measure now, so we can vary that. Um, I'm going to spend just one more minute. Uh, we've had this evaluated. It's the only system that has been tested with youth. Uh, three big outcomes, no effect sizes I'm going to give you. We found the first thing is can you affect clinician behavior? Because remember, this is not a treatment in and of itself. So we need to change what clinicians are t talking about. And the session report form tells us, yes, they're now talking about problems that are showing up on the questionnaires. It did improve clinical outcomes uh, from our longitudinal data, from both the client's perspective, the clinician's perspective, and the caregiver. Kids, um, clinicians who are exposed to, who could be exposed to, so intents to treat um, feedback, kids got better faster. And then, because implementation is very problematic in all interventions that we do, we find that those clinicians who read more feedback reports, who had more questionnaires filled out, did much better than those that didn't. Um, 
So we have a dose response effect. Now, one of the things I've looked at in the history of this is, is childhood cancer as a model. And what's the relevance of childhood cancer? Well, in about 30 years, the cure rate went from 20% to 80%, especially in leukemias. Um, almost every child who's treated for cancer enters a clinical trial. Every child treated adds to a knowledge about how to improve treatment. Um, every client treated should be an opportunity to learn. Few agencies in mental health systematically collect information to add to scientific knowledge and to improve, and let alone clinical knowledge in their own community about how to improve. So we're losing a major opportunity to learn how to do better by not collecting this type of information. Um, we have a desperate need to have services data infrastructure that includes more than just payments, and that's what we have now. Uh, and that tells us very little about how well are we doing. Inclusion, we focused on access issues to the detriment of effectiveness. Access will always win out. It's more politically acceptable. Everybody gains by increasing access, except who? If you don't know the answer to that, I've just wasted a whole lot of time. Client doesn't benefit. Not in our current system. We do not monitor, monitor implementation or effectiveness. And I have imagined, I, when I first wrote this, I said, imagine a banking system that couldn't track its money. Uh, we don't have to imagine it. I gave this talk in Dublin, and they, they laughed at that one, because uh, they, they knew it a lot better. We need revolutionary evolution approaches. Measurement feedback systems is one way. However, we're undertaking, we're just starting this process, and it's difficult and complex. And therefore, we're still at the early s <laughs> stages of doing this. So we're not quite sure what we need yet. Thank you.